Thank you very much for the very warm welcome which you have given me to Knox College. Thank you, President Gordon, for your hospitality and for the honorary degree which you will give me later if I pass the test of this convocation address. <laughs> These have been good days in Toronto. Good weather, not what I was told to expect. And it has been a delight to share time with members of the faculty and students alike, and also to renew acquaintance with former students of mine in Cape Town and friends, as well as this fine city. I'm no stranger either to Toronto or Canada. On one occasion during your summer of 1983, I drove with my wife and two of our children from Montreal to Vancouver. Discovering the beauty of the Canadian lakes and forests, the excitement of the Calgary stampede, and the omnipresence of your national bird, the mosquito. <laughs> now, a convocation address is always difficult, especially when you fly in from the unknown into the unknown, and you try to visualize the people who you will be addressing. And I am obviously addressing you above all but I want to address you as part of a wider community of friends and family and the wider church and the academy. And that's quite a challenge. And I know that Principal Gordon is a little worried about what I might say because she keeps, keeps on telling me to keep it simple. <laughs> well, now, we have recently had an election in South Africa and the ballot paper is at least as long as that, and there were 29 possible parties for which we could vote. Most of them not serious, although they all thought they were. <laughs> and one of them was called KISS, which I was very tempted to vote for. KISS stands for Keep It Simple. I didn't vote for KISS, even though I was tempted to do so. But um, I did think when I voted about this convocation address and whether or not I would be able to put my, my ex next to KISS tonight. I remember a friend of mine who was a professor of theology in South Africa and a Presbyterian minister as well, who when he was preaching in his uh, congregation before he came to the university where I also was, he used to say when people asked him, why were some of his sermons so erudite and beyond comprehension? His comment was in response, every now and again, I have to inform you that the mystery that I am preaching is far beyond your comprehension and mine. <laughs> now, I might fall into that error this evening, but I am reminded of the fact that one of my theological heroes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he declared to his father that he was intending to study theology, received an icy response. What a waste of talent, his father said. I don't think you're wasting your talent at all. And therefore, I want to take your talent very seriously this evening. And although I'm speaking down, I'm not speaking down to you. I want us to go together on a roller coaster journey into the mystery of your calling. And if you remember anything of this evening's convocation address, I want you to remember that you didn't fully understand everything, because neither do I. But at least you thought it sounded important. And that's what I'm going to try and make it sound. So fasten your safety belts. It's all a mystery. It's all incomprehensible. And I make no apology. Because St. Paul told us that we, who are called to the ministry of the church, and that includes everyone, of course, should be stewards of God's mysteries. 
And in the course of time, the phrase Christian mysteries came to refer to the sacraments. But for Paul, God's mysteries referred primarily to the good news disclosed to us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The mystery revealed is God's purpose to reconcile all things in Christ and so bring to birth a new humanity in which everyone is restored to the wholeness of life. This is an incomprehensible mystery of grace, which only faith can grasp. And therefore, I ask you to allow your faith to try and grasp what I'm trying to say. But it gives us hope, for it is embodied in the one who embraces us and the world in redemptive love. To share this good news and to celebrate this mystery is an enormous privilege. It is also an enormous task of those called to be faithful stewards of God's mysteries. Despite the fact that the term mystery was associated with mystery religions and Gnostic cults, Paul frequently uses the phrase God's mysteries in one way or another to express that what had now come to light in Jesus Christ had long been hidden. The cosmic secret was out at last. It had taken humankind a very long time to discern that the ultimate mystery in whom we live, move, and have our being loved the world so much. As custodian of this good news, the church cannot be a mystery sect which keeps its secrets to itself, secrets known only to some initiates and boasting of its spiritual athleticism. On the contrary, the church is a movement initiated into and empowered by the Spirit to make the secret known to the whole inhabited universe, and to do so in order that everyone might discern the indescribable beauty and love of the one who seeks to embrace all of us, that life-giving, gracious mystery that is greater than we can imagine, yet without whom we cannot live with purpose and hope. Even so, the mystery of which we are stewards remains mystery beyond our full comprehension, even though what has been disclosed is always sufficient for us. This notion of mystery has been central to Christian tradition through the centuries. We can see it reflected in the design of church buildings, the oldest of which had sanctuaries resembling the empty tomb of Easter Day lit only by candles which spoke of the light that had broken through the darkness. Mystery was at the heart of the sacramental rites that evolved through the early centuries of the Christian tradition. And the medieval mystery plays that enthralled those who, devastated by plague and war, watched in awe. This sense of mystery remains in large sections of the church, especially in the East and its liturgical traditions and rites. It has become problematic in the West since the Enlightenment, regarded by many as a hangover from the dark ages of magic, superstition, and ignorance. And that may give you the clue as to why I am speaking on the subject. The Reformation helped initiate this process of disenchantment. Skeptical about mystery, wary of sacramentalism, iconoclastic towards sacred objects and space, and committed to the plain sense of the word and the simplicity of communal space. That is our tradition. But there's a very darn negative side to that. The rise to predominance of science made the process irrevocable. Reducing the realm of mystery to detective stories and fantasy tales. And cybernetics has completed the task. For while the internet may be a mystery to some of us, the mysterious cloud in which our data, including this uh, convocation address, is stored, is not the cloud of unknowing, but a warehouse in California. What has mystery become? All knowledge, though not all wisdom, is available to us and can be downloaded at the click of Mickey Mouse. Mystery has become banal, 
its true meaning expunged from our consciousness by technology. In short, the contemporary world within which we are stewards of God's mysteries is, despite its vulgar religiosity, essentially secular in character. Even amongst those who claim to believe in God, especially on this continental outpost of the Western world, many are embarrassed by the idea that anything is ultimately beyond our control, that there is a hidden dimension to reality that defies human analysis, and that the meaning of life cannot be reduced to digital formula. Yet we cannot live without mystery. This is evident on, on every hand in the rebirth of paganism, the prevalence of astrology, and the flourishing of old as well as new spiritualities. You seldom find a worthwhile Christian book in airport bookstores or in indigo. But esoteric literature abounds, attracting as much attention as glossy glamour and health magazines that inform us about the secret lives of the rich and famous. We who are called to be stewards of God's mysteries should welcome this spiritual hunger, even though we discern the emptiness of the solutions proffered and decry much of its substance. These hunger pains of a growing disenchantment with disenchantment heralds the recovery of a sense of mystery in a sterile environment shaped by reductionist science and secularism. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer noted in a sermon he preached in London in 1934, the lack of mystery in our modern life means decay and impoverishment for us. He went on to say that a human life is of worth to the extent that it keeps its respect for mystery. At one level, skeptics are right to be embarrassed by the discourse of mystery and our recourse to the language of mystery as its stewards. Too often we people of faith have used it as a tactic to sidestep the searching questions posed by science and philosophy. We should rather acknowledge the legitimate task of science, in fact its divine calling to uncover all that is hidden, to find answers to all problems, to explore every nook and cranny of space, and to lay bare the secrets of the human enigma as well as the mysteries of the universe of which we are a tiny fragment for a very short fraction of time. As stewards of God's mysteries, we are not in competition with science and its unending quest to explore the ever new mysteries that appear on the horizon of our knowledge. But we do struggle against scientism that arrogant ideology which claims that there is nothing beyond what can be empirically proven, nothing transcendent that holds us to account and gives meaning and purpose to life, no ultimate mystery that draws us deeper into mystery even as our knowledge expands. This mystery to which we bear testimony is not within the domain of scientific exploration nor is it to be discovered in the gaps of human knowledge or reduced to a controllable formula. It is the core of reality, the ultimate mystery we name God, unusable as that word may have become for many. We do not discover and unpack this mystery as though we could deal with it in that way. This mystery discloses itself in ways that take us by surprise, changing lives, restoring dignity, and transforming the world. Now, just as we are not in competition with science, so we are not in competition with genuine secularity. Secularity is an affirmation of the world as world. It light, rightly rejects false dichotomies, religious ideologies that distort reality, and hierarchies that subjugate us. As stewards of God's mysteries, we honor and respect human freedom, dignity, equality, and inclusion as pointers to the coming of a new heaven and a new earth that is 
the mystery yet to be revealed. But in affirming secularity, we struggle against secularism as we do against scientism. Secularism, an ideology without values, promoting license, greed, and a lack of respect for the other, as well as the earth that sustains us and the mystery that enfolds us. In affirming the world as world, we equally affirm that it is God's world, and therefore declare that the world can only truly be the world, truly secular, when it acknowledges that ultimate mystery which gives its meaning. As stewards of God's mysteries, then, we seek the insight and the company of science, and we struggle alongside secular humanists who are committed to justice in serving the common good and caring for the earth. And along with them, we are also engaged in struggling against false religion. By that, I don't mean Presbyterianism. False religion is not a denomination or a non-Christian religion. False religion runs through all religions, religious institutions, cultures and traditions, and not least our own. False religion, the target of prophets of both old and new, is idolatry, religion claiming to own and control God's mysteries rather than being the stewards of God's mysteries. Christianity is as prone to such idolatry as any other religion. The turning of the church into an instrument of colonialism or big business, the commercialization of Christianity, the abuse of ecclesiastical authority, the sanctioning of war in the name of Christ, or legitimating conquest, racism, xenophobia, homophobia on the basis of crude exegesis are all symptoms of idolatry. Idolatry exalts those whose power exceeds the boundaries of being human and dehumanizes its victims created in the image of God. Idolatry tries to control the mysteries in order to control the source of all mystery and to do so for its own ends. This is the mystery of iniquity which serves the lie, fosters hatred and enmity, and foments violence. Now, by contrast, as stewards of God's mysteries, we bear witness to the mystery of the one who gives life, the mystery of the God who is spirit, the mystery of grace disclosed in Christ, which gives human life worth and the universe hope. To be faithful stewards of these mysteries in such a world is no small challenge. But I'm afraid this is your calling. And for this you have spent years in preparation. You do not leave here with all the skills needed or all the answers, nor will the time come when you can say anything other than that we have had this treasure in earthenware pots. For who cannot be overwhelmed by the very idea that we are called to be stewards of God's mysteries? Who are we to speak of such things? That is why true theology always begins in silence, listening for the word that discloses mystery. We will never, you will never cease from struggling with honest doubt as we listen for the word, nor will we boast of certainties that arise out of our own or our institution's insecurities. Whether we are faithful stewards will not always be self-evident and might only be revealed at the end of our journey of faith. But to become trustworthy, we ourselves have to learn to trust. And that is our calling, even though this too may be a mystery known only to God. There will be times when you have to be social prophets standing shoulder to shoulder with others committed to the same concern for justice. Yet in doing so, you will not stop being stewards of God's mysteries, for it is precisely this that will give direction and purpose to your witness in speaking truth to power and expressing solidarity with the powerless. There will be many times when you will stand alongside those who are suffering, grieving, mourning, 
times when you yourself will suffer, grieve, and mourn, times when you bear witness to joy and hope when others despair. But in doing so, you will not only be a grief counsellor or a social worker, a compassionate friend, but always a steward of God's mysteries, helping to bring light into the dark and frightening spaces of human experience and existence in order to bring healing and restore wholeness. And week by week, as you teach and preach, you will be doing more than educate or engaging in fine rhetoric. You will be stewards of God's mysteries, helping people to discern that that which has been disclosed in Christ awakens faith, inspires hope, and enables love. And then you will discover also why in the course of time God's mysteries came to, be, came to refer to baptism and the Eucharist. For it is when the common things of life, the water without which we cannot live, and the bread and wine which we need for food, suddenly become for us the fountain of life, the bread of life, the cup of salvation. Don't ask me to explain how this happens in the Eucharist. John Calvin once remarked, simply adore the mystery, he went on to say. And yes, there will be those times when the mystery of which you are stewards seems remote from the humdrum of the tasks you are called to perform and the presbytery meetings you are obliged to attend. And you too are gripped by disenchantment. Is this what I train to do? Days will pass when you will forget the mystery as you struggle with insoluble problems and perplexing experiences, finding the solutions you have long pronounced are inadequate. But then maybe with the poet Denise Levitoff, you will discover with her and for yourself that once more, the quiet mystery is present to me. The throng's clamor recedes. The mystery that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything, rather than void. And that, O oh Lord, creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it and sustain me. Thank you very much.